Trust a Zombie, Chapter 10, Suburban Home. A man I don't recognize is leaning against the front of the house when we pull into the driveway. That's my dad, Rachel says. He looks like a proper cowboy, I observe. He's wearing boots, jeans, shirt, and hat, all straight out of a western. He's a cowboy right down to the way he holds his cigarette. As though she's reading my mind, Rachel says, Dad didn't smoke before, but he figured since it doesn't matter now, health-wise, he'd pick it up as part of his image. He grew up watching cowboy movies and stuff. I'm suddenly blinded by the science of it all. Does he get the high from the nicotine? If your brain still operates at a normal level, is it affected by drugs? I ask. You know, I never asked him. I don't recall him ever saying anything about that. He just said it went with the image. I've never tried it. One time I tried getting drunk, early on in my life as a zombie. It didn't work. I expect the same would be true for nicotine. I know Tylenol doesn't do anything for me. Not that I really need it. Pain isn't the same as it used to be before the virus. Interesting. I parked the car on the side of the driveway. Rachel's dad doesn't move except to take a drag on the cigarette. Are you ready? This is the point of no return. Either we get my parents together and tell them I told you or we don't. We can just play off this visit as me wanting to introduce you to them, and then after you leave, I can discuss Frank with them. Do you want to play it safe and not tell them I told you? Rachel seems nervous. Let's tell them, I say. I don't think this is all real to me yet. There's a part of my brain that says she's playing a prank on me. I'm pretty sure my subconscious won't fight it anymore if I hear it from her parents. This doesn't seem like the kind of prank most parents would keep up with or be interested in. I think if we just get it out there, then maybe I'll be able to fully accept it. Maybe then I'll be able to accept the girl I'm crushing on has a virus that makes her a zombie. That's what I'm hoping for. What a strange thing. You know what? I'm going to answer this phone call. Hang on. I just had to uh, reschedule an appointment. Where was I? <laughs> uh, okay. I'll repeat. Maybe... <coughs> Maybe then I'll be able to accept that the girl I'm crushing on has a virus that makes her a zombie. That's what I'm hoping for. What a strange thing. Okay, Rachel says as she opens the, her door. We both get out of the car. Rachel cheerily greets her dad, who comes to life from his Marlboro Man pose, and greets her back, just as cheerily. He waits for Rachel to introduce me before he acknowledges my presence. Dad, this is my friend, Eric Sterling, the one who just moved in. The one who just moved in. I wanted to bring him by to meet you. He met Mom yesterday at school, Rachel says. Rachel's dad diverts his path and walking toward us in order to, order to meet me at the front of the car as I walk around. We shake hands. He says, my name is Tom Sutton. Nice to meet you, Eric. Good to meet you, Mr. Sutton, I say. Dad, is mom, or is mom around? I want to talk to you both about something, Rachel says. Mr. Sutton looks at Rachel, then at me, and then back at Rachel. Looking more like a cowboy than ever, he squints and rubs the back of his neck while speaking. Yeah, she's just inside. Do you want me to call her out here? Let's all go inside, Rachel says. Again, Mr. Sutton looks at me and then back to Rachel. All right. Mr. Sutton takes a final drag on his cigarette before dropping it to the loose gravel and packed the dirt of the driveway and then grinding it in with the heel of his boot. I don't know why you picked up smoking, Dad. It's not a healthy hobby, Rachel says. Hmm. That's all he says about it. I smile covertly. Rachel's dad is cool. For a zombie smoker, I mean. I follow Rachel and her dad into the house. Dr. Sutton is sitting on the sofa with the television on a news channel. She doesn't look up right at look up as <laughs> it's hard words are hard she doesn't look up at us right away but i assume she must have picked up on our group in her periphery as her eyes snap toward us her gaze rests upon me initially her face suggests surprise perhaps alarm but she quickly forces a smile however not fast enough to conceal her initial reaction hello eric i didn't know you were coming over at saying this she looks at rachel with one eyebrow raised in question next she looks at mr sutton both eyebrows rise in what I assume to be an even stronger question. Hi, Dr. Sutton. I decided to let Rachel take charge here. I'm not going to take the lead on saying anything. I'm just here for the show. I'm hit by the realization that I just entered a house of zombies in the middle of Nowheresville, Texas, without anyone else knowing where I am. Rachel's mom turns off the TV and stands up. Well, come on in, everyone. No need to stand in the entrance like that, Dr. Sutton says as she waves us all in. Dutifully, Mr. Sutton takes up the recliner as Rachel and I sit on the sofa across from where her mom is. Mr. Sutton kicks the footrest up on the chair and settles in. If we have time later, I'm going to see if he can teach me to mosey. If anyone knows how, it's going to be this guy. Rachel starts the conversation, ending the awkward silence and pained expression of keeping up social politeness on her mother's face. Mom, I need to tell you and Dad something. You will likely be mad, but please hear me out. Dr. Sutton immediately looks at me in that initial surprise initial look of surprise appears again, but this time the alarm I thought I saw at first is gone. I look at the floor. 
I told Eric about us, Rachel says, cutting right to the heart of the matter. I look up in time to see Dr. Sutton's expression relax. The surprise is gone, and although she isn't smiling, she looks content. Mr. Sutton doesn't stir at all. He remains reclined in the chair, feet up, hat resting on a knee, hands folded on his chest, and his eyes focused on the ceiling, as far as I can tell. Now the doctor smiles and squints briefly, but the smile is insincere. What do you mean about us, Rachel? She asks. I mean, I told him about Atlanta, the CDC, our virus, why we are living in Texas, our fears about Frank, and all that's in between. Rachel maintains a very even composure while saying this. Not surprisingly, I feel my anxiety level increase, and with it, the brightness of red in my cheeks. Rachel's parents both look at me, then back at her, and then back at me again, Dr. Sutton asks me. What did Rachel say about our virus? I think the real question she wants to ask is, do you think we are zombies? I follow Rachel's lead and cut right to the thick of it. She told me that you have some type of virus that has reanimated your bodies, that you are all dead and the virus is living in your bodies. She said you were zombies, I explain. Tom Sutton has a laugh like a carnival. Upon hearing the word zombies, he explodes in a booming laugh, causing his whole body to shake, and consequently the chair he is sitting on, he is resting on as well. Arlene Sutton isn't as amused by my response, but she isn't going but she isn't so caught up in the severity of the conversation as to ignore her husband's boisterousness. With a little smile, Dr. Sutton reaches over and slaps her husband's foot. Tom, it isn't funny, she says while trying not to laugh as well, though presumably more at her husband than at the shocking revelation she just received of her daughter's failure to keep the family secret. Eric, Dr. Sutton begins, with one last sidelong glance at her husband who was attempting to control his laughing fit. Rachel wasn't supposed to tell you about that. I'm sure she has told you what she, that she wasn't supposed to tell you about it. I planned for a time like this, <clears throat> in case Rachel did tell someone. I know it isn't easy for her. Now looking to Rachel, she continues, It isn't about not trusting you. It's just that I figured if I were in your place, I wouldn't be able to keep this hidden forever myself. I'm disappointed in the consequences that may follow, but not in you. She says she is disappointed, but she doesn't sound disappointed at all. Yesterday she seemed pretty relaxed and jovial, but even, that, even with that type of personality, I would expect a more severe reaction of what is happening right now. Something is off. Thanks, Mom. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry for telling him, but I had to. But I had to, Rachel says. I understand. Dr. Sutton returns her attention to me. As I was saying, I had planned for this situation and expected that I would flat out lie about it and use some virologist jargon to convince whoever the person was that Rachel was embellishing a story to make it sound cool. I know that would likely put me in a bad spot with her, but I always thought it'd be easier to have that discussion with her later than to deal with the reality of someone finding out her secret. But sometimes you just don't know what the right thing to do is until you are in the middle of it. And now that we are in the middle of it, I don't think that plan would be for the best. Yeah, this is suspicious to me. These people have just had their whole world up, turned upside down again by their daughter this time, and they are barely acting anxious about it. Either I'm really a non-threatening person, or they don't get worked up about things very easily. Or who knows what. I can't help but think that if I were a real-life movie monster and my secret identity was revealed, I'd be a little more irate. Even if I understood the situation, I think I'd still at least be angry at Rachel for a few minutes. But maybe being a make-believe monster in real life gives you a more open mind about accepting life-altering information. Perhaps that's another benefit to becoming a zombie. After a sufficient pause, enough for me to think about everything, Dr. Sutton finishes her explanation. So yes, Eric, we are zombies, but not like in the movies. Not exactly. Obviously, it wasn't something you could tell just from looking at us or talking with us. I hope you understand the importance of keeping this secret. Right, I had no idea until Rachel told me. Even then, I think I was still suspicious of it until now, hearing it from you two hearing it from you, too. But I don't understand the need for secrecy. I mean, I guess I can see how you wouldn't want everyone knowing about it and hounding you. This way you get to live normally, mostly. But the fact that you can live mostly normally makes it seem like you should be able to announce this thing to the world and it'd be okay, I say. The Suttons look at one another. I look at Rachel, who smiles and then takes hold of my hand. Mr. Sutton slides his chair upright and stands up, squaring his hat back on top of his head. He starts for the front door. Dr. Sutton says, Eric, you are free to do what you want and tell who you wish about us, but we hope that you will keep our secret safe for us. It makes it difficult for us that Rachel told you, but it is understandable. I'm glad that you appreciate your friendship enough to be so understanding yourself. <laughs> Mr. Sutton is now behind me by the front door. I thought maybe he was going outside to smoke, but instead of a door opening, I hear a strange thud. A split second later, I feel the effect of that thud. Unsure of what caused it, I realize that whatever it was, was something solid colliding with the back of my head. For a few seconds more, my head reels, and I see Dr. Sutton standing up and walking towards me. Someone says something, but I can't distinguish who or what. My final awareness is Rachel's face. Her eyes darting from me to her mom and back to me. Her mouth opens, but I don't hear anything. She leans towards me, reaching with outstretched arms, and then darkness. Oh, that's the end of the chapter. Look at that, a cliffhanger. Didn't see that coming, did you? I didn't. I forgot all about it.
It's uh, amazing how much I've forgotten about this. Okay, well, chapter 10. Thanks for listening, and uh, chapter 11 next week. See you then. Bye.